So, so basically, okay, so uh, as Pablo already made an introduction of every development in this field, and in particular the, the detailed introduction how to understand the physics of magic and graphene, I'll concentrate really um, on some uh, sort of aspects which we're developing over this year, and of course then I'll talk mostly about the, the work which uh, we've done uh, in my own lab. Okay, and so basically I'll... I'll I'll talk about, about the development story of superconductors and correlated states in the system where we actually observe more of the, these correlated states at different filling factors. Uh, I'll talk about orbital magnets and actually you also start to see an almost quantum hall effect in, in these devices. And if uh, time allows, which it probably will, uh, I'll probably also touch base on applications because that's, that's also uh, a field of uh, progress right now. Okay, so. No, the same, the same completely messed me up. Yeah. I can't, I can't go through the slides. Yeah, okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, somehow it's completely messed me up. Yeah, no, I mean, usually, I mean, it's the first time I see that. Okay. Okay, wow. Okay, so, yeah, so the All right, let's see, I'll just retry. Uh, sure. I mean, I, I was using the same. I was using it. Okay, now I can go on. All right. Okay, so um, so basically, uh, we're uh, we're a young group, so we exist only for about two years, and we're located at ICFO in Barcelona. So we're we're locals, even though we don't speak Spanish actually. Uh, and uh, the the work which was um, mainly uh, done was by Charles Lou, Peter Stefanov, and Cecilia Das, who uh, are making these uh, superconducting devices. And uh, also Paul Seifert, who I'll uh, discuss uh, later on, he's, he's also looking at the first applications of, of these materials. And we're also very uh, happy for uh, theoretical support by Alan McDonald, who helped us interpret our first results. And now we're also discussing with, uh, actually with uh, Andrew Vernovic and uh, Emmett Levito. Okay, so uh, basically, uh, I just wanted again to touch base on that point which Pablo made about Vistronics and how special this really is. And this is a little bit uh, my uh, take on this. So as, as Pablo mentioned that people have grown heterostructures for years, right? So for like 30 or 50 years, I don't even, I don't even know how, how far that goes. People have developed uh, techniques how to uh, create heterostructures. And so the cartoon image of this is, is basically like that, where basically with MBE, you sprinkle atoms on top of uh, uh, crystals uh, in a naive way. And then depending on what kind of atoms you sprinkle on it, you can assemble different types of materials. Correct me if I'm oversimplifying this. 50 years. Just 50 years, yeah. okay, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, you can basically tr uh, create any type of uh, material on top of another material. And basically you can really go with different atomic species and you can uh, create uh, these beautiful hydrostructures, which uh, is kind of an amazing uh, piece of engineering. But as you can also see from, from that, uh, that picture, of course, atoms just uh, have to line up crystallographically with the underlying surface. So if you sprinkle them, they uh, automatically inherit the lattice, uh, uh, crystallographic lattice configuration of the underlying uh, substrate. So the twist angle in such materials is always zero. So there's no way uh, really you, you can uh, move from that. And um, also like one picture I wanted to show is, for example, uh, in uh, a V header structures, the control is, is amazing. Uh, so you can grow really all kind of um, header structures as you like, so you can really control layer by layer by layer. But also in, in all of these images you can see uh, every atomic species sits exactly on top uh, of the other uh, atomic uh, species. So really as uh, Pablo pointed out, it's really Lego. So in the sense that the top layer has to line up uh, with uh, uh, the bottom layer and uh, all these layers are just locked into space. So, and in this case, uh, when people started playing with uh, twisted bilayer graphene, and in general, a graphene on board nitride in general, and people started exploring this. Yeah, sorry. Just to comment on that, I, th I yeah, think there are, many, that, yeah. there are many systems where actually, when you deposit metals in MBE, you also get a Marie angle. But it's fixed, you can't tune it. Okay, so it's a fixed. But it's not always, it's not always a line. Okay, all right. Okay, so then there's exceptions. Okay. 
Um, okay, so, and in this, uh, so, uh, nevertheless, so still, uh, when we, when people started looking at uh, these uh, Van der Waals heterosexual structures, um, people quickly realized, okay, so it's definitely not like Lego, it's really much more disordered, right? So you, you basically really, whenever you assemble uh, these materials, it's really disordered, and it's really more like, uh, I think Alan McDonald made this uh, comparison, it's really more like a pile of Persian rugs. So really, uh, the systems are chronically uh, um, assembled one on top of another, or like the other comparison, which, is pro which is probably probably takes credit, it's like a deck of cards. So you can really rotate these layers um, uh, uh, in, uh, in, any, uh, in any given way, and so this was known for years. So I think only on the recently people started re really realizing uh, the potential which uh, comes uh, comes from this type of uh, um, um, assembly. Okay, so and basically, as uh, Pablo mentioned, uh, now uh, there there are many developing stories, all coming uh, from this Pastrana trick. So there's uh, a correlated insulator states of superconductivity in, in, in graphene. Uh, there's uh, presumably a strange metal phase, even though this is, of course, uh, 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 a big debate right now. We have now magnetism, we have anomalous quantum Hall effects, so we have also topology in the system. And all of these uh, phases as, uh, uh, are basically tunable uh, with a gate in one single device. And in principle, of course, this, this alone gives you already a lot of different uh, opportunities to cross-correlate cross all of these uh, interesting phases. Okay, so um, in, uh, in my talks, I'll, I'll gonna uh, have this following outline. So basically, I'll first talk about transport of devices with high twist angle homogeneity. So as, as uh, Pablo mentioned, twist angle homogeneity is a big source of disorder in these devices. So uh, uh, Typically, uh, over the years, we have figured out how to make extremely high quality graphene heterostructures. So graphene sheets now reach mobilities over a million at low temperatures. You can observe uh, anomalous, uh, you can observe fractional quantum Hall effects and things like that. Uh, however, um, sort of these uh, high quality doesn't necessarily translate to a twisted bilayer graphene because here now the source of disorder which we have is twist angle and strain. So it's, it's not like impurities, it's not uh, lattice defects, which uh, produce this type of disorder, but this is twist angle uh, homogeneity. I, I will touch base on the evolving phase diagram uh, uh, between the correlated states and the superconnectors. Uh, then I'll talk about uh, magnetic phase transitions uh, and anomalous quantum Hall uh, effect in the system. And then in the end, if I have time, I'll, I'll talk about some first applications. Okay, so and um, as I as I already mentioned, so um, how does uh, what is twist angle uh, in homogeneity? And basically, uh, I'll, uh, you can think of it uh, as shown in this STM image from the Columbia Group, where they basically image a typical uh, magic angle device, and they can basically uh, see the Mori lens. So this this image here, it's not it's not that big. It's like a hundred by hundred nanometers. Uh, and basically what they do is they just uh, measure the height map uh, of, the, uh, of the graphene. And uh, typically we find that the AA regions usually have a slightly different height. So because the, the atoms probably uh, uh, like to repel each other more uh, in, this, uh, in this region. And basically the, the, the yellow, uh, yellow dots which you see here, those are all AA regions. And then uh, they're connected through these AB regions. So, so basically get this perfect triangular lattice uh, uh, the, basically the Morel lattice of twisted by graphene. But what you can also see here is that this lattice is by far not uh, perfect. So if you look at the lattice constant here, here in, in, in the bottom corner, or the lattice constant here in the top corner, you can see that it's, it's, it's adiabatically uh, deformed. So you might get, just uh, within a 100 nanometer device, you can get um, um, twist angle uh, changes uh, over several um, digits, uh, digits of a degree. Okay, and this is similar to what Pablo was showing about the scanning squid experiments, with, where they can map out the twist angle uh, by lando level spectroscopy. Okay, so in, in principle, as also was mentioned, is that such the, uh, such uh, disorder, of course, also affects the transport properties. So it would be in principle a big challenge to. To see like what 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 is uh, what in our transport results is intrinsic and what is actually uh, disorder uh, there. Okay, so and this is uh, this is uh, sorry. Just yeah. to be clear, in that image, the bright yellow 
are where you have the AA alignment. Is that right? That's right. That's yeah. AA. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and the, these are pres presumed like so these AA regions are presumably where the electrons can localize, right? So it's okay. So um, and um, just to also uh, give you sort of our view where we think this disorder comes from. So this is typical uh, uh, optical images of uh, uh, the heterostructures which we're making. So usually when we assemble these devices uh, and we take a, a look at an optical microscope, this is how it all looks like. So usually we have uh, um, uh, the bottom HVN, so this is the substrate on which the graphene sits, and somewhere here, uh, it's hard to see, but we have this twisted bilayer graphene sheet, and then it's all topped top, top off another HVN uh, layer. So this, so you're looking at uh, four, four layers of one of materials, so it's usually graphite, HVN, twisted bilayer graphene, and graphite, and typically when we prepare the samples, uh, initially, we can see that there's a lot of uh, in homogeneity just, just by, by the optical microscope image. So you see a lot of bubble bubbles here forming. So and these bubbles are typically found in Van der Waals materials because uh, again it's like saran wrap on saran wrap or like a st uh, like a sticker which you glue on a sticker, you know that you always trap some some air bubbles or things like this. And this this happens here. But of course in terms of twist angle these air bubbles are strain centers. So they're really changing the uh, so in the in surroundings they're changing the the twist angle of the device. So what we have uh, um, succeeded in doing, we have succeeded in really squeezing these bubbles out, releasing all the strain of the system. And so uh, this is typical uh, device image uh, before, and this is a typical device image uh, after, after we do this mechanical squeezing process. And you can see here in the final device image, we, we don't see any, any type of bubbles, and definitely, um, Okay, so maybe to the untrained eye not, but to, to the trained eye, this is definitely uh, immediately a much, much cleaner uh, device. Okay, so into the devices we're making, uh, basically, uh, again, are uh, the follows. So we, we use a graphite becke, which is separated from the twisted bilayer graphene by a very thin uh, hexagonal bore nitride dielectric, and then we cap it off uh, with another layer of HPN. And uh, as uh, was explained in the previous lecture, we can just apply a voltage now to this graphite and uh, capacitively couple it to the, the graphene. So we can use this graphite just as a, as a local gate and we can uh, tune the carrier density uh, through the graphite. Okay, and uh, so this is, this is an AFM image now of, of a typical device which we're having. And so what we, what we also can do is we, um, and, and yeah, and you can see, so sort of the AFM image really doesn't show any any bubbles, it's perfectly clean, it's perfectly flat. And uh, if we now measure the twist angle between all the contacts in the device, we really find that the uh, twist angle is extremely homogeneous. Okay, so, uh, and again, how do we measure twist angle? So this was a little bit explained in the previous lecture, but basically because uh, depending on the twist angle, uh, also the filling of uh, Moray band uh, changes. So when, whenever we make the, uh, the unit cell of a Moray band bigger, so we, uh, so sorry. So since we can only fill four electrons per Moray unit cell, if we make the Moray uh, unit cell larger, of course, we uh, that means that we need less electrons to fill up a Moray band. So if we now uh, look at the position of uh, of insulating uh, dips here, so this is a conductance measurement as a function of carrier density. So the position of these insulating dips in the carrier density tells us exactly what the what the twist angle uh, of the device is. And so we can perform these measurements in all different regions uh, of the device, and we really find that the twist angle homogeneity of our device is extremely good. So we, we have a variation of less than 0 0.01 degrees over about 10 microns. And um, so it, 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 as far as we understand, this is really some, uh, the greenest devices uh, out there right now. And of course, because this, this question will, uh, will arise, so of course the question is, also, do we see, for example, all these effects which are described in all the regions of the device, right? So do we see superconductivity uh, in every region of the device if we would use different contact pairs? So this, to, this is just to give you uh, another device which we made recently. So this is, again, uh, a device which is fairly large. So this is it's like about 6 micrometers broad. It's about 30, nanometer, 30 micrometers uh, long. So this is... Um, five or six times bigger than the typical devices uh, which we made previously or which are made by in a group of Pablo, for example. 
Again, we get an extremely uh, high homogeneity of bit angles all across the device. And this is, uh, this is a typical measurement of the superconducting state. So this is uh, resistance as a function of carrier density in the region where we see, where we see the superconductors. Uh, and uh, all the different curves here is just basically using different contact pairs uh, in the device. So really, across the entire device, without any state phase separation, we see a macroscopic uh, superconducting uh, state uh, everywhere in the system. Okay. Okay, so now, um, now how does it manifest itself in the, in the transport data? So this is, uh, uh, this is data from the Columbia group where they measure just resistance as a function of carrier density. So, so as uh, Pablo explained, uh, usually this is what we measure. So this is resistance, this is carrier density, which is basically a voltage of the back gate. And then we, we like to translate this carrier density into electrons per unit cell, or, or filling fractions of the, uh, of the Mori man. And then as you can see, so um, when the resistance is measured, uh, it really changes several orders of magnitude uh, depending on the carrier density concentration. So we start at the bent edges where we have these uh, bent insulating states, we get uh, mega ohm resistances, but then if we, we fill, start filling up the gap, we first get these superconducting states where the resistance basically drops to zero. Then we get exactly at half filling, at here at uh, minus ns over two, we get insulating states, and then we get also insulating states at plus uh, uh, equals two. And uh, these are these basically these locations at uh, minus uh, two electrons per unit cell and plus two electrons per unit cells is exactly uh, are exactly the locations where um, Pablo first uh, observed these not like insulating states, which are then flanked by the superconducting states. Okay, so we repeated the same measurements now. Um, uh, right, and, th and this is basically uh, the phase diagram, which uh, um, which is used. Uh, by, by uh, Pablo these days. So uh, this, is, uh, this is the phase diagram where really, uh, as, uh, as we go to the edges of the Moray band, if we are basically at a minus four electrons per unit cell where uh, the Moray bands are entirely empty, uh, we're getting this band insulator, which is marked by a high resistance term. Then at zero filling, we get the charge neutrality point, which is also uh, a highly resistive state. Then uh, we fill, completely fill up the energy, uh, uh, the, the energy band uh, with uh, plus four electrons, we again get a band insulator. And in the middle of each of these bands, at exactly half filling, or in other words, minus two electrons and plus two electrons, this is where the correlated insulator uh, appear, and this is where also the superconductors appear. Okay, so, but I think uh, in, immediately when we uh, started um, uh, Looking at this, um, uh, uh, what, uh, what of course arises the question immediately, why does it, that do these correlated insulating states, the superconductors appear only at uh, minus two and plus two electrons, whereas of course um, the uh, graphene has uh, valley degrees of freedom and, uh, uh, in addition to spin degrees of freedom, so in principle you, have four, uh, you can have four electrons per unit cell, two electrons for the, uh, the valley degrees of freedom and two electrons per uh, spin degree of freedom. So naturally the question arises, why there are no correlated insulating states when you fill like one electron per unit cell? Why, why there's nothing here at minus three, for example? Or why there's nothing at minus one, which corresponds to like one whole per unit cell? And uh, as Pablo already marked, so uh, the stars here correspond to uh, novel measurements. So, um, so in principle, um, uh, basically uh, we, we picked up on, apart from that. So this is now measurement from uh, the devices uh, which we made. So these devices are uh, much more higher in twist angle and homogeneity. And what you can see when you compare it with the results from uh, the Columbia group, you can see immediately that uh, a lot of the features are actually the same. So again, when we sit at the, uh, the edges of the wire band, we get these insulators. So these are the locations here and here. So this corresponds to these locations here. So this is. This is the same, you get a, 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 you can get a, a, dip at, a peak at charge neutrality, so this is corresponding to here. Then as, uh, at minus two electrons per unit cell and plus two electrons per unit cell, we get these insulating states, which, which are the half of insulating states, which were important before. But then you can see that in principle, we get resistive uh, peaks everywhere for each integer filling. So we get it for uh, minus three, for minus one, plus, plus one, and plus three. 
So now, uh, really, the, the, the picture evolves that, in principle, the, 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 uh, there are now correlated insulating states everywhere uh, uh, in the phase diagram. Every time when you have an uh, integer filling uh, of an electron or a hole uh, per Moray unit cell. So it's not just half filling, but it's a quarter filling, it's three quarters filling, uh, and so on. Okay, so. Okay, and then uh, the other thing is, which you also or also notice from uh, this measurement, is that uh, not only uh, resistive peaks appear in many different um, locations in the phase diagram, but also these uh, zero resistance states appear in many uh, other different regions. So, for example, here between minus three and minus two, we have a resistance that drops to zero, but it also does so between minus one and zero, and it also that does so between zero and plus one, and also also here. So in principle, not only do we see more insulating state, but we also see more uh, of the superconducting state. And the evolving phase diagram uh, is now the following, where um, again uh, this is all plotted like uh, in the same color scales which which uh, Pablo was using. So uh, basically, what we're plotting here is just resistance as a function of temperature and carry density. And uh, red regions correspond to highly resistive states, so these are the insulating phases, and the uh, dark blue regions are the superconducting uh, states where basically resistance drops to zero. So you can see, again, uh, here are the edges, the, the bin insulators, in the center there's a charge neutrality point, and then here, these are all the correlated states um, uh, at all the integer fillings, and in between almost all of the correlated insulating states, we see uh, superconducting states, uh, um, um, and uh, these three, for example, these, these two, which are close to charge neutrality, and, and this one here, which is close to uh, uh, to, um, to the filling factor two here, uh, these are the superconducting states, which are new. Uh, okay, so and um, sort of um, um, so and, and sort of you know, so these results in principle are consistent, I think with the results of, um, of uh, Pablo and from the Columbia group. So in principle, really all of the uh, gaps which we're extracting from, uh, from the insulators, uh, they're indeed the strongest for the minus two and the plus two states. However, we, we, we think because we have cleaner devices, we now observe uh, other gaps which are much smaller. So for example, the, the gaps at uh, quarter filling or uh, three quarter filling they're uh, several uh, times smaller than the gaps at half filling, but probably they were not uh, resolved in the previous uh, results because just disorder uh, in, in these inhomogeneous devices uh, easier, can easily kill uh, uh, the, um, such small gaps. And the same is true for the superconductor. So, so basically, if, uh, if I look at this superconducting state, where, which has a TC of 3 Kelvin, this is exactly the same superconducting state which shows the highest TC in Pablo's results. So this is really uh, free Kelvin here. However, this, these uh, other superconducting states, they have TCs of around 100 millikelvin. So they have TCs which are 30 times uh, smaller uh, than, um, uh, than this main uh, superconducting states. So in principle, it is also possible that uh, the origin of these superconducting states is, is different. Uh, and uh, for sure, it's possible that such a small superconducting gap uh, could be obscured by a disorder in the system. Question? Yeah. So, uh, the quarter or three quarter are these in four? Um, so you're resolving for degeneracy, 12 degeneracy. That's right. For valley. Yeah. So, okay, so um, let me, let me, so this is sort of the, my understanding of what's happening. So, so as, um, uh, as, as uh, Pablo was explaining, so, uh, in a single particle picture, you basically can think of it uh, in the following way, right? So you have this valence band and conduction band. Uh, in the valence band, uh, both bands are fourfold degenerate. So you have K, K prime uh, spin up and spin down, where K again corresponds to belly, uh, belly degrees of freedom. And then, of course, if um, in, in the case of uh, half filling, uh, and if you take interactions into account, this this is what what can happen, right? So in principle. Uh, you develop this interactive gap uh, in the, in this case, in the conduction band if you tune the Fermi energy to half filling. So then, in principle, what can happen is, we don't know yet for sure, but what can happen is, for example, that the uh, top band 
uh, is spin up polarized, the bottom band is spin down polarized, right? And uh, nothing happens to the value degrees of freedom. So both, both are value degenerate. But of course, the other thing which can happen is now in, in the case where you have um, uh, uh, interacting gap opening at every integer filling, eventually you also have to consider, of course, this, this type of picture, where maybe the 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 one of the one of the bands are fully polarized, right? So it's a belly and spin polarized. And of course, in, in in any of this configuration, you are supposed to get presumably ferromagnetic, some sort of ferromagnetic states, right? Uh, so wait, why yeah. do you draw them thinner than huh? it for any particular reason? Sorry. That when you are opening the duct, yeah. So you are you are um. Drawing the band thinner, you are not just shifting. Yeah. So no, I mean this is. For some particular reason. I'm yeah. So because uh, if uh, I have uh, if these bands are spin polarized, that means each band has the same amount of electrons, right? Yeah, but so but the the, the band width is the same. Uh, why is the bandwidth narrower on the right? It's just because there's one electron above the fermion. So why is it why is it narrow? Yeah. yeah. So should. Uh, I think my, my th okay, so the energy energy should not be narrow. I think probably I should have. I, I, it, I was, it's just fewer electrons, but it, yeah, you're right, you're right. So you made the area half as big. Yeah, that's right, but yeah, that's right. That I, I should have made the area just half as big, but it should have been the same, yeah. Right. I didn't know, it was easier to draw. So, <laughs> yeah. You see, like, I didn't, didn't use much, I didn't, I didn't apply all my um, graphic skills in this, in this Sorry, yeah. another question. Yeah. Uh, the spin or body with a uh, breaking of the degeneracy, why do you call it more? Yeah, so this is, I think, Pablo addressed this question in length, right? Well, Pablo now call it just correlate. You know? I, I, also, <laughs> I also didn't use uh, the word mod, so again, all of this is a developing picture. So, um, so all, of these, uh, all of these explanations right, right now, I mean, for me personally, this is just really brainstorming. Okay, so this is just, uh, just, um, uh, we, we don't have any conclusive uh, um, explanations yet. So we, we don't know which of these states is spin polarized, we don't know which of these uh, states is value polarized, but if I start thinking about um, what is breaking in the system, then uh, I, I think it's either, it's, it has to be either belly or spin, whereas of course uh, some, something more complicated can happen as well. But again, this is all a developing story, this is just really to, to give a first yeah. impression. If, but very quickly, if you have this picture in the middle with spin yeah, polarized right. state, wouldn't you expect that if you apply magnetic field, there will be even larger splitting? That's right. That's right. Again, this is this is not this is just to just to give an idea of what happens. So Pablo said that in his case the the gap cl closes, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Then at um, but then at one quarter, for example, people observe that the gap is becoming bigger. Okay. If you apply field. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, and then the other thing is in the bi bilayer graphene. Uh, this is work done by Philip Kim at Columbia uh, at, at Harvard. Uh, they actually in bi bilayer graphene they see a, a half uh, half filled uh, correlated gap at filling two, and they see that it actually opens up in par par parallel uh, parallel magnetic field. So uh, it uh, it's really just um, you know bi bilayer graphene. There could be again a different picture evolving. So again, this is just. This is not to, to tell you what's happening in twisted biography, this is just really to start reflecting on what are the possibilities, I guess. Right. So I want to follow up on yeah. that question and what uh, um, Pablo said. Yeah. I thought he said that when they applied the magnetic field, right. it became more metallic. Yes. So That's right. That would not be consistent with having yeah. a... Yeah, yeah, this was, I think this was exactly the previous yeah. question. Yeah. So then, what, what was the, so your answer was that... Um, um, Different systems system behave different. For different. Hotter, feeling, hotter feeling, um, which is the very right point of picture, what he was saying was when you apply field, indeed the gap becomes larger. No, no. Oh, okay. But in which only because it's not smaller? Yeah, yeah. But even that is not consistent. Right, right. Uh, the one in the middle would not be consistent the one with it becoming metallic in the presence of the magnetic field. Yeah, right, right, right. Okay, sorry. So in the in the case of uh, bi bilayerophy, uh, that gap becomes bigger in in, in parallel magnetic field than 
that's consistent with parameter, right? Yeah. So, so, so in body right. body layer, yeah. that, I'm not going to body by layer. It's too complicated. <laughs> just the magic layer. Magic, just one body layer. Okay. Yeah. That would not be consistent. Again. This is this is not this this these these pictures are not not to tell you the final story about this about technique. This is just really to explain you the possibilities we have to take into account. So really, the the message here is that we have four degrees of freedom. We have k, k prime, spin up, spin down, and in principle, uh, it is uh, all of these degrees of freedom might be broken. Okay, and uh, I think the way I'm thinking about our results now that um, we have now at um, Every integer filling we have a observed correlated insulating state means that uh, we probably split up the, the whole Mori band in uh, regions where uh, um, where basically the band split up uh, into all of these degrees of freedom. That's a very likely uh, likely I think uh, scenario. Okay. Um, all right. So so um, then you know so just just also to um, to uh, to explain uh, the, all of the superconducting uh, super states here, so what we do to really characterize the superconducting states is the following. So as uh, as uh, as standard in the field, so we have of course measure just resistance as a function of temperature. So we uh, we really see that all of uh, these superconducting states they um, they uh, become uh, the resistance just drops to zero at um, at low enough temperatures. And again, so the the, the black line here. Is the state which is also uh, uh, observed in, in the previous work. So this is the state where we observe a TC of around three Kelvin, <coughs> and then uh, these uh, states at lower TC. So you can see. So this is around a TC of around 150 Kelvin. These states uh, really um, really have low, much lower TCs, and at the same time they also have much sharper positions. And also, which which is similar to uh, the previous talk. As you can see, also the linear temperature dependence, which leads to the superconducting states, it is surprising the linear. I would say from in, in this case, it's it's linear from around uh, 100 millikelvin to around uh, 30 30 kelvin. So it's a really huge range uh, of uh, temperature over which this linear temperature dependence uh, exists. And in principle, uh, uh, um, in, of course, there are debates whether this could be also electron photon interaction, which induces your linear temperature dependence because this is actually also expected in graphene. But then the surprising part is that really this linear temperature dependence exists down to 100 millikelvin, where in principle all the photon effects should be should be naturally much weaker. So I think uh, in, in, in some sense this uh, these, this data also confirms. Is, Does the uh, habit to report the 50 point line as the TC? Yeah, the 50 or 50 yeah. Kelvin. Yeah. <laughs> <50 percent. laughs> Okay, so then the other thing, of course, we do, uh, we also apply a perpendicular magnetic field. So this is resistance as a function of temperature, and then uh, we apply a magnetic field, and really this, uh, these superconductors are killed, and we recover again uh, above 300 millitesla, we recover again this linear temperature dependence. So in principle, this linear temperature dependence, it uh, continues to go to even lower temperatures to even like 10 millitons or so. Then of course from, from this data we can uh, we can um, extract the critical magnetic field and we can plot it out as a function of temperature so this is right here and we again uh, get a similar uh, behavior as in the previous work where we can uh, fit our system uh, yeah, these graphs of uh, the Ginsburg lambda field. Okay, and uh, last but not least, also we we, we like to measure um, nonlinear. Um, um, Nonlinear connectivity in the device, so this is a DVDI uh, as a function of uh, uh, current, and as you can see, there is a really really sharp uh, transition when we uh, when we basically reach the critical current of the system. So the, the transition is much sharper than expected for a free a free D superconductor. So the transition really is uh, consistent with the VKT uh, transition for two D superconductivity. Not that we needed to. Um, not that we needed a final proof that our graphing is two-dimensional, but still uh, it's, uh, it's uh, good uh, that it is consistent. And of course, last but not least, for all these superconnectors, we eventually also see uh, evidence of quantum coherence oscillation, again, uh, uh, from uh, probably from very weak phase separation in the system. So again, even though um, we think our system is, is uh, much cleaner, still 
we probably get some normal uh, normal regions, and the superconductor in uh, rare cases is shortened by a normal region, and therefore we get this Josephson-like uh, behavior, and we get this from Hopper interference pattern. Okay, so and basically now uh, the evolving uh, story now, and this is this is was an APS physics um, uh, report um, review article by Alan McDonald, which was published a couple of months ago. So in principle, the the, the evolving picture now is the following: that uh, not just at half filling you have these correlative insulating states flanked by the superconductors. So this is uh, this appears here and here, but also we have many more correlated insulating states which can appear at all the integer fillings of the system. And then, in principle, uh, around these correlated insulating states, in many locations, you can find uh, dome-shaped dome superconductors which are flanking these. And in principle, of course, you could uh, you could start thinking along uh, different lines. So, for example, uh, again, uh, touching base, if, if you would imagine that one of these correlated insulating states actually breaks out is is um, is um, giving rise to bands which are spin polarized, then of course you would expect that some of these superconductors probably might be affected uh, by that. And, and uh, since the nature of each correlated state uh, could have different degrees of, field, of, of freedom, so it could have um, valley or spin, different valley or spin configurations, etc., it is feasible that uh, the superconductors could have also different origin if you assume that really the correlated insulating state is giving rise to these uh, superconductors. Of course, the other uh, explanation, which could also be, as again was uh, mentioned by, by Pablo, is that in principle, we don't know yet what the nature of the superconductivity is. So it could be also possible that in principle, the entire band likes to be superconducting. Um, and then um, um, you have a competition between the correlated states and the superconductivity, and the superconductivity blends over uh, sort of loses to the correlated insulating states in the locations where these uh, these appear. So this is again uh, this is the, this is the basically I think uh, an ongoing debate right now in the field. Okay, so uh, if um, okay, and and you know, and I I again, please don't take this to uh, to uh, you know as a final explanation of anything here yet, but just uh, but just really. Um, you know, uh, there's there are certain uh, knobs that we can we can try to test uh, sort of the, the evolving picture here. And the test is basically we can we can try to measure quantum oscillations. So we basically uh, uh, can measure schumann hass oscillations in the system, and we can try to uh, really um, uh, try to understand the underlying uh, Fermi surface uh, of the of the of the individual bands. And this is basically. Uh, um, 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 happening uh, in in this uh, Landau Fermi diagrams, which we can uh, we can measure. So okay, so uh, so basically, in, in a typical Landau Fermi diagram like this, what we're measuring is basically uh, we're applying a perpendicular magnetic field to the system. We create Landau levels in the underlying bands, and basically now we can uh, start uh, look in more more detail on these Landau levels and try to understand the degeneracies. Okay, so and basically this is again just a resistance measurement as a function of per perpendicular magnetic field, and you can see. Uh, so, for example, here is again the band insulator. Uh, on that side is a band insulator. This is a charge neutrality point, and these uh, red lines here these are the uh, half filled insulators. And you can see, for example, from charge neutrality, you have these straight lines appearing, and these straight lines are basically just individual under levels in the system. Okay. And uh, just to um, just to uh, sort of uh, give you uh, uh, a reason why why we see straight lines in the local <coughs> levels, and really this just uh, comes from uh, from from the um, lambda level condensation, where where basically each lambda level uh, can take uh, so many uh, uh, so many electrons, and basically when we increase the carrier density, we can actually uh, fill up those lambda levels. And actually, when we uh, increase the magnetic field, uh, we also can pack more electrons into each individual lambda level. And then the relationship which you get in the end is that really, uh, the, for each lambda level, the dependence between magnetic field and carrier density is linear. And really, uh, what, what this means is that really all these linear lines here uh, in dn over dd, these are each individual lambda level. So what we do now is from the slope of each individual lambda level, we can sort of can uh, tell how many electrons per unit cell um, 
uh, each bundle of the tape. Is this about four electrons, or like for a uh, k k valley um, for a valley and uh, spin unpolarized state, or is it maybe less less than than, than these four electrons? So and indeed, so we, we now can look at these slopes here, and here at charge neutrality we usually get a sequence which where we really see that all of these lambda levels are fourfold degenerate. So we, we get sequences of minus four, minus eight, minus twelve, minus sixteen. And this tells us that really what happens for, to, to, the, to these bands, which are closest to charge neutrality, is uh, that they, uh, they, they, they should not have k or spin degrees of freedom broken. But then we also see uh, lambda levels originating from the uh, correlated insulating states, from a minus two state here and the, from the plus two state. Jesus. <laughs> Um, and, and then, you know, if we look at the degeneracies of these um, uh, lambda levels, then we find the degeneracies of minus 2, minus 4, minus 6, minus 8, minus 10, and also the same here, 2, 4, 6, 8. So basically now, you know, we, we, we already know so that in these uh, lambda levels we can uh, pack half of those electrons as close to charge neutrality, so that's already an indication that some sort of uh, either spin or k degree of freedom is broken here. So the, the, the underlying symmetry of these bands is different. And then if you go to the minus three state here, so this is where presumably we have only one electron per unit cell. We have uh, no degeneracy at all. So uh, really the sequence is one, two, three, four, it's, and so on. And so presumably some of these states then have to be uh, either uh, both K and uh, spin, uh, spin broken. Okay, so this, this gives us some, some first clues uh, of um, really uh, how to understand the underlying um, states. Okay, so this brings me again to this picture, and again, you can, you know, you probably you can change spin, so maybe these are uh, belly broken and, and uh, these are spin broken, etc. So I think uh, it's just really uh, um, we don't really understand yet uh, conclusively what's what's on the line picture. Okay, so and um, how much? Time? Is that ten minutes. So, ten? Uh, yeah, ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. Right. So the other thing is, uh, what, what is really um, interesting about this, these, point, uh, these Landau fan diagrams is that actually, so I talked about minus two and plus two, but actually what we also see is that the, at, at some of the odd uh, integer fillings, so for example here at plus one, we don't see Landau fan diagrams. So we, we don't see these fanning out uh, line shapes, but we see that the insulating state, the position of the, of the insulating state itself has a slope, and this slope uh, is uh, consistent with a filling two, or in other words, it's consistent with a chart number of two. Okay? So what we believe is that these states here, they, they're actually not lambda levels, but these states actually uh, have to do uh, with, some, uh, with some potentially topological insulating states. And I'll, I'll, I'll show more data to support this, this claim. Okay? So, and, 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 um, and interestingly, so if I, if we, for example, zoom in into, into this region here, so when we have first like a linearly developing uh, insulating state in my field, and then it, it gets this, this slope shape, if we zoom into this region, then first of all, we observe a, a metal insulated, superconductor to insulated position, so we, we uh, hit this uh, state and we, uh, the system becomes much more insulating. And second of all, which is much more important, is that if we go with magnetic field along this line, we also observe a magnetic hysteresis. So this is, uh, this is uh, uh, measurements of RxY, really in exactly around the uh, minus one electron per unit cell filling, and we can see that really in this narrow region around exactly minus one, we see a magnetic hysteresis when we sweep the magnetic field up, or we sweep them down, and this magnetic hysteresis disappears when we go to higher densities left and right from the uh, integer filling condition. Okay, so and, and so um, so basically, uh, we uh, we believe that um, really uh, there are some uh, some magnetic phase transitions in the system happening. So uh, in this particular case, the magnetic phase transition happens at at, fi at finite fields. So we, we believe that uh, this is probably some magnetic stabilized. Uh, uh, magnetic uh, magnetic position. So this is a transition which does not uh, is not magnetic at zero field. But then when you apply high enough uh, magnetic field, we induce some sort of magnetic uh, magnetic phase. Okay. So um, 
Okay, and uh, this brings me this brings me sort of uh, to the to the last uh, point I wanted to discuss. So um, so there was uh, um, there was a lot of work uh, on the anomalous quantum Hall effect in the last recent years, and as Pablo mentioned, uh, anomalous quantum Hall effect was now uh, uh, discovered also by the uh, by the UCSB group uh, in uh, uh, in Magic and Graphene. And basically, uh, of course, uh, what, what happens in these systems is that if you have uh, some sort of ballistic system which inherently is magnetic, uh, you, you sort of expect to have edge states uh, propagating uh, along the line of the, of the sample, and what you're expecting is that you have magnetism, uh, magnetism uh, as appearing, uh, sorry, um, you, you expect uh, quantized edge states to appear uh, at zero, uh, zero field, uh, zero magnetic field. So basically, if you measure R, R x y in the system, then uh, at starting at zero field, you have a perfectly quantized edge states uh, with uh, h o, um, uh, over e, e, e squared. And then, if you increase the magnetic field, you can switch this uh, this edge state uh, to uh, plus one quantization or to minus one quantization. If you have sort of the system uh, around, around the system, and this is exactly sort of. Uh, uh, then, of course, the, 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 the scenario which one, one might expect also from twisted valley graphene that one would find uh, mag magnetic phases in, in some of these correlated and slowing states. Okay, so, and, sorry, okay. And this is, for example, this, this picture from, uh, from the, from the uh, UC Santa Barbara group, so indeed, yep, almost finished. So indeed, uh, they, they have measured uh, this type of effect in twisted valley graphene, so, Again, they uh, measure Rxy uh, as a function of magnetic field, and they see really perfect quantization of plus one uh, and minus one uh, at, at, at around zero magnetic field. And the ongoing uh, explanation right now is that uh, presumably it's a, a orbital ferromagnetism which is developing in the twisted bilayer graphene. So because um, um, you know, because, so, so basically the idea is that you really have these orbital ferromagnets. So you have these uh, current loops which are forming, presumably because of value degrees uh, are, are broken, and then you have you basically also ought to develop this um, uh, orbital ferromagnetic phase basins. So and uh, just to touch base on uh, our own data, sorry, our own data. So indeed, so as I showed in the last uh, in, in in the last phase diagram, so we have now another sample, which now uh, has a very similar line of end diagram. But in addition to uh, the Lislano fan diagram, we observe uh, basically almost per, um, uh, Rxx dropping basically to zero around minus two, uh, filling of minus two, um, um, where we don't observe uh, uh, any Shubnikov uh, Dehaas oscillations. So we zoom in into, into this region so we can measure Rxy as well. We get really almost full perfect quantization of these uh, uh, plus and minus two. Uh, fill, uh, filled, filled states, and as you can see, really uh, here we have uh, perfect quantization of uh, Rxy with a shared number of two, and we have also uh, if you flip the magnetic field, we get a quantization of uh, minus two. Okay, so this is basically traces which we can uh, we can take, so we really get perfect quantization uh, in some of these states uh, originating at um, uh, magnetic fields at around uh, uh, 0.3 tesla, and really. Um, uh, if we now take a line cut of this as a function of magnetic field, we recover a very similar uh, feature like uh, what was observed uh, by the UCSB group, where we really, uh, by sweeping the magnetic field, we get perfect quantization almost to zero, which then uh, 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 flips the uh, sign uh, when we, uh, uh, when we uh, tra transition uh, uh, the magnetic field uh, above zero. Okay, so with this, uh, I want to wrap up. So I think, I think, um, um, I think uh, really, um, uh, twisted bilayer now uh, shows a lot of different phases. So we have developing stories on the superconductors. We have developing stories on the correlated insulator states. Uh, we have maybe strange metal behavior. We have topology. We have magnetism, and then it appears that really this. Uh, this uh, uh, idea to use twistronics uh, for Moray systems is really universal to many other systems. So here, this is uh, the bi bilayer graphene work uh, by the Harvard group, where they see superconductors in correlated states. In ABC trilayer graphene, people see uh, very similar things as well. And last but not least, uh, which is not unpublished, I, I hear that Columbia and Harvard they also see 
correlated insulators and superconductors and twisted uh, um, TNDs. So those are two-dimensional semiconductors. And again, by rotating them one on top of another, you can induce these, system, these, uh, these phases in a non-carbon system, so basically, which is very different from, from graphene. And uh, yeah, with this, thanks. Thank you very much. So, um, so I think I think this is an idealized picture. So I think uh, what's what's worth is to start looking at real data. So let's let's uh, look at the data of Columbia, for example, right? So data of Columbia shows um, a very weak correlated insulator here, which is almost killed by, the, by a real large superconducting state here, and they don't see a superconducting state on the right hand side of that insulator. So let's take a look at the, this uh, this uh, insulator. So this insulator is super strong. There's also superconductivity only on one side of it, but there's none on the other side. So so in the, in this picture here, in this picture, that would mean that they don't see this superconductor, and they all, almost don't see a correlated insulator here, and they see a, don't see this superconductor. Okay. And then in Pavel's uh, paper here, so in the original paper, uh, in the data which he showed in his last talk. So these two superconductors appear only at, at the whole region. So in, in this paper, they didn't see any superconductivity signs in the ele electron belt region. So I think, I think um, what you really uh, need to, to take this uh, phase diagram, uh, to understand this phase diagram, you, you really need to say, uh, understand that this is sort of the convolution of all the different samples they measure. But not every single uh, sample shows exactly the same phase diagram. So sometimes you see superconductors only on this side, but not on the other side, and so on and so on. So, uh, so it's very sample dependent uh, whether you get, you know, which part of the phase diagram you actually resolve one, one at a time. So about the orbital variables, right? Yeah. So you know, and then, yeah. So about the orbital variabilism, um, I would think a variable net is something that's magnetic and zero. Right. Yeah. So how do I think about? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> So, um, right, so we, we, again, this is all a, a developing story. So I think, um, uh, so, 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 so the reason why, um, mm, why I think people believe that this is orbital firing magnetism is because probably, they probably assume that it's a belly degree of freedom is broken. And when you have a broken belly degree of freedom, you kind of expect circular loops to happen. So I think this, this sort of explanation right now arises from the fact that uh, they were expecting these things probably to be very very polarized or so, but I I don't think there's again no conclusion on this. This is just a de developing uh, interpretation. Oh, just quickly, I want to register the data for the ISC series. Yeah. Yeah. Is considerable width. Is there any comment on that? Oh, the ISC? Yeah. So just the resistivity data for the width of the of the transition. Right. It's a little wider than. So you can start right. with what you see. So. Oh, so this this one, right? Uh, so why 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 did why did C so different? Yeah. So um, yeah. So um, so of course we don't know. But one again, if if you would think that really uh, these are correlated states which give rise to the superconductivity, if you go with this picture of unconventional superconductivity arising from a mod-like or correlated insulator state, then since these these all of these uh, states are could have different symmetries, it could have different magnet, you know, spin degrees of freedom, different uh, k degrees of freedom, so you could also think that these are different interactions, which which could give, give rise to the superconductors. So you, you don't expect a superconductor to live close to the 
uh, what water state to be necessarily the same as the one which was supposed to the, the fluid factor two state for a fill state. So this is one of one of one of one of the sort of uh, explanations what we give. On the other hand, okay, so TC is also much lower here, so then the transition, I think, also should be an error if if you have a much lower TC. Um, that would be just like a conventional sort of explanation. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, maybe you mentioned that, but in, um, how much does correlate experimentally in the samples of the different groups yeah. to observe these ferromagnetic tendencies at, uh, um, you have three electrons, I think it is, right. and to have a gap at the charge neutrality point. Right, and so I think, I think all of these, all of these uh, so in very young's result, they have a, a large gap at charge neutrality. Okay, so and uh, they have the coupling to the HVN? And they have coupling to the HVN, okay. that's right. In our case, we, we have um, now five, five devices which all show a charge neutrality point gap, but we don't think, uh, we don't think it's aligned. So again, it's really hard to prove it's aligned. We, we try not to align it, but we really, almost every device shows a charge neutrality point gap without us trying to align it to the HPN. Yeah. And the gap is always more or less the same size? It's, it's, uh, it varies between 0.5 MeV to 1.5 MeV. But Andre and then uh, Andre and then Andre. I have a completely dumb question for my yeah. series. Uh, you mentioned that one of possible explanations right. is that superconductivity everywhere interacted right. by. Yeah. And in your phase diagram, it looks very much like this. Right. But your phase diagram, I guess, shows temperature in a logarithmical scale, right. not an absolute scale. Right. If you plot your data in absolute temperature scale, yeah. does it look like superconductivity everywhere interrupted, or it looks like one peak and then superconductivity yeah, no, 30 times smaller? No, look, than I mean, so, I mean, we, we really did an honest job with these with these yellow lines, okay. So we went for each each data uh, each data trace and right, 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 right. But right. temperature is in logarithmical scale, I guess. What you show here. That's no? right. If you plot temperature in absolute, you, scale. you'll see the same thing. You'll see the same thing. Uh -huh. You see, you'll see the same thing that just this this going smaller. But really, the the what where we, how we drew the the yellow lines of mm -hmm. superconductivity is we look at the temperature dependent trace. We saw that here was for each trace for each density we take. Resistance drops to exactly zero, and we mark with the yellow line the position of 50% of the resistance. So really, um, um, here, uh, yeah, you wouldn't be tricked. You wouldn't be tricked if I would plot it on a normal, normal scale. Yeah. Um, is it known whether this is type one or type two supercomputer? Uh, we we don't know. Does anybody know? Huh? Uh, does anybody know? Uh, no, I don't think so. No. So so um, so I think so. Pablo showed these uh, these results from scanning squid experiments. In principle, th there was hope that with the scanning squid, they could uh, measure Meissner effect, uh, and they could maybe maybe even you know map out the lattice if you apply magnetic field, but like a, um, like a Abrikosov of lattice or so. But uh, I think the sensitivity they need for for to resolve these these uh, very small. Um, uh, uh, responses is very, very, uh, very high. So I don't think they can reach this because it, because it's a two-dimensional superconductor. Plus, it has the lowest carrier density ever reported for a superconductor. So the sort of diamagnetic response would be extremely weak. So probably you do, you would almost not get any magnetic screen across, across the device if you apply the field. Is there another question from Brad Yeah. So what are the applications you wanted to talk about? Okay, I have enough time. <laughs> yeah, take so, time. Okay. <laughs> All right. So okay. So okay. So okay. So I, I think uh, uh, so we work out this graph. Okay. So uh, as we said, that uh, twisted bilayer graphene has the lowest carrier density of any super connector. Okay. So if we really compare, so we, we really uh, did the job to um, work out, you know, what are the thinnest superconductors you can get, and what are the carrier densities of these superconductors. So usual superconductors which uh, you um, you use for superconducting electronics, right? So which are used for single photon detectors or traditional edge sensors, etc. Uh, they're usually sputtered superconductors. And uh, like the aluminum nitride, aluminum, aluminum. So, so these these are all like well-developed technologies, and people know how to make uh, thin films from these. 
So if you look at the thickness, the people can make these uh, superconducting, they're usually in the order of, of 10 nanometers, maybe they can go to 8 nanometers or something like that. Uh, and um, graphene is 0.6 nanometers. So graphene is an order of magnitude thinner than these superconductors. And, and uh, whereas these superconductors are disordered, they're amorphous because they're using the sputtering, this is a single crystal superconductor. So this is an ultra clean system with one uh, domain wall. And the other thing is, of course, if you look at the carrot density uh, of the superconductor. So again, for aluminum, it's 10 to the 17 per centimeter squared. Uh, and in graphene, it's, it's six orders of magnitude lower. So basically, it's, uh, it's by far the lowest carrot density superconductor. So uh, you can really think of using uh, twisted ballet graphene for quantum sensing. So, so these spiral superconductors are used, for example, for these, all these sorts of applications. You know, so they're used for bolometers, uh, for radio astronomy or particle physics, they're used for single photon detectors. And all of these detectors rely on the principle that you have a superconducting phase, but for very low heat capacity. So like an absorbed energy can really induce a superconductor, sort of superconductor to a normal transition. Okay? And of course, if you now uh, look at the heat capacity of graphene, uh, based on this graph here, right? The heat capacity of, of uh, this is by like graphene is just orders of magnitude. It's like uh, almost six orders of magnitude lower than any of these superconductors. So I think it's really a promising uh, uh, application in quantum sensing, and we, we just have we just post we just submitted a paper where we really explore its use as a, a bolometer and single photon detector for terahertz light and for gigahertz light, and we really find that we have, can build energy resolving single photon detectors in the terahertz and in the gigahertz. And such technology just doesn't exist yet with the normal superconductors. Okay. Well, on that note, let's thank our speaker.